Okay, how many potential leaders in the room? I have a little exercise for you, it won't take long, and trust me, I want everyone to stand up and to close your eyes and not peek. Don't move from your chair or you'll hurt yourself when you sit down because you're going to sit down with your eyes shut. Okay, everybody stand up. Nobody peeking at the screen. All right? Sit down if you're not a clinician. Sit down. This is going to be a big one. Sit down if you're over 40. <laughs> sit down if you don't believe that your discipline and what you do adds great value to the system. Sit down if you have neither persistence nor resilience, or if you're very obstinate. <laughs> sit down if you're a poor negotiator or you're submissive. <laughs> sit down if you're weak-willed or you're oppositional. Sit down if you're daft or don't have common sense. <laughs> Sit down if you're uncreative or you're completely, your friends think you're completely wacky. Okay. Sit down if you have a poor self-image and that people don't trust you. Finally, sit down if you think that you can only work 35 hours a week. Right. Those... <laughs> Okay, and probably, yes, I can count, there's about six people. Right, now you sit down, you all sit down so that no one can see, you can all open your eyes. Okay, we have six potential clinical leaders uh, of the future in, in the room. Um, so um, come and see me afterwards and we'll get you in training. But that's, so those are attributes I think you're possibly born with. I'll show you a photo right at the end uh, which, which will amuse you um, about um, you know, whether these things inherited or not. But having got those attributes, necessary attributes, that's not enough. In this complex world, a um, complex world that is health, we need an understanding of the, both the strengths and the weaknesses of evidence. And, and this is a biggie, an understanding of the political process, which is not something that you are trained for. Um, at, uh, so, here we go, uh, back to our triangle. Um, and some of you will be aware that just occasionally there is a disconnect between uh, the, the um, kind of world views of health professionals and those of politicians. Um, and um, evidence is often used by both uh, to try and support um, their positions. So why is that? <coughs> well, oh, sorry, we, no, um, it may be because sometimes we are asked to do things that we think are just crazy. Let me introduce you to this 82-year-old um, woman, 83 years now, how old she is. And she's had um, uh, hypertension for 25 years. Um, uh, which has uh, been very well controlled on a low dose of beta blocker and otherwise uh, uh, keeps pretty well and is um, uh, moderately active. Uh, every um, time she goes to pick up her prescription, or for many years, every time she went to pick up her prescription, it also had on it a prescription for a statin. And she had to heard from her friends that she didn't want, well, yes, she didn't know why she needed it. No one ever died of heart disease in her family. Um, so she wasn't going to take it. So she went, each time she'd go to the chemist and say, don't give me that, please. And she, they said, oh, okay, we won't give it to you. So every time she took the prescription, they didn't get it. So she went, when she went back to the doctors a few times and said, I don't take this, could you take it off my prescription? They said, no, no, we'd rather you left it on your prescription because it's then on our database and it helps us meet our target. <laughs> now, she's a pretty strong world woman and she's going to um, not, um, not uh, do that. So eventually they did take it off the prescription, probably because she had moved over the age band where it was necessary to have her on the <laughs> There she is again. Uh, about to go on a little boat trip. She's a very, 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 very timid woman. Uh, so there she is on the left, and then shot over jet, um, aged uh, 82. And, um, and the, the, the young 15 year old who was accompanying was told, under no circumstances, let us sit on the edge because that's where you go the fastest. <laughs> so afterwards, he said, I tried, but she wanted to sit on the edge. <laughs> She's also been ballooning over the Nile recently and doing all kinds of other things. So, you know. Um, don't, um, uh, but, but a fascinating example of where the system is crackers, but it was to do with targets. And when you do come across a daft target, <laughs> when you do come across a daft national target, my strong advice to you is don't aim too high. <laughs> don't set your sights too high, I should say. Yeah. Okay, now you've got to imagine again. Now I want you to, we'll catapult ahead, now I want you to imagine it's two, uh, 2016, it's five o'clock at night, and you're just off to, the, to a meeting and you're, and you're running late, and uh, uh, 
patient, 65 year old lady, comes in, she's a late fit in, and you say, oh, well, okay. But she's, she, she's breathless, the receptionist. You have a policy that anybody who wants to be seen turns up, does get seen that day. So you sit it down, and suddenly your computer's going mad. The screen is just flashing and flashing and flashing at you, and it says, Standard battery of screening questionnaires out of date. Please urgently complete before the end of the next audit payment cycle. This is a, going to be a significant drop in practice income if this, if this woman does not get. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, thanks to our colleagues in Auckland, all of these have been reduced to two questions with a third which says, would you like some help with that? <laughs> Sorry, Bruce. Is he actually in the room? <laughs> An hour later, and you're still halfway through, and she says, I only came for my asthma. Can I use the nebulizer, please? Okay, so um, I think you get the, you get, um, they get the theme as to where we could go. This is one future direction, and it's, future, it's a direction that the, that the UK has certainly taken. And I ask you the question, if we get there, was that a failure of clinical leadership between now and then? Okay, so my, my top box, the paradigm of professionalism, and I obviously could a whole talk on professionalism, I'm not going to, but then you've read the work of Robin, Robin Downey, he has quite a good list, some would say it's outdated. But the one I want to focus on is independent of commerce and the state, and that's an interesting thing for health for professionals to do, and it gets us into all sorts of trouble. I, you know, wearing my, one of my hats as, as, a, as an academic, I'm very keen to bring out the university charter, which says about number two, that we are the critical conscience of society. So I've got permission to do this, I don't know. Um, but I think all health professionals need to do this. And should you need any persuasion that um, I'm not just scaremongering, I would um, suggest that you, this is an incredibly read, good read, but not late at night. This is a, a, a very long inquiry um, uh, that the UK Health Select Committee uh, went through in the um, five or six years ago, and the report is chilling reading. Just two bits. Can you read that at the back? Okay, for those of you who forgot their glasses this morning, just the two bits I've highlighted is talking about the oversight of the pharmaceutical industry. The consequences of lax oversight is that the industry influence has expanded and a number of practices have developed which act against the public interest. The industry affects every level of healthcare provision from the drugs that are initially discovered and developed through clinical trials to the promotion of drugs to the prescriber and to patient groups to the prescription of medicines and the, and the compilation of clinical guidelines. And that's important. Uh, and it goes on, if you read the bit at the back, it's saying, you know, even, even the guidelines that come from these, um, you know, austere institutions, we have to be aware that there is a commercial influence that has basically penetrated every aspect of the um, evidence that we use. Okay, so um, this, is, this is a pretty unpleasant slide, but um, one that I used just earlier in the week when I was um, talking at the IHI conference about the way in which in, in, in Canterbury we have tried to um, kind of change what we had to try and minimise those influences. And this I put to you is a, is a pretty standard model still in many places where the PCP, the, the individual primary care practitioners, um, essentially have um, uh, freely accessible by, to, to, um, from industry um, and um, a lot of the CME is paid for by industry and the content is delivered by a secondary care um, who themselves are influenced by industry. Those same people in secondary care they populate the guidelines groups, they advise the PHO performance program, they help set the national targets. Um, and poor old individual practitioner is in the middle of all this being influenced from um, all directions. And of course that's just the professional influences. There's the influences of patient pressure. If an advert is, there's an advertisement on television for a particular medicine and the patient comes in and asks for that medicine, what proportion of people do you, th in what time, what proportion of the time does the person get that? Anyone think it will be less than 50%? Yeah, about 60% of the time people get what they ask for, even when the prescriber would not have chosen that medicine for the patient. So it's a very, very strong um, influence. And what about the state? Why is it that we end up sometimes not seeing um, eye to eye uh, with politicians? Well, anyone who knows me, I can't see eye to eye to anyone, but, but this is... This is <laughs> you probably can't read this. This is the latest Maury poll, 2011, about who the public trust. 
and, and uh, you probably can't read it, but guess what? Top of the list, I am so, so proud of myself. Because I fill the top three spots. I'm a doctor, a teacher, and a professor. I mean, what more could you want? That's... Unfortunately, the poor old politicians um, come down right at the bottom. Um, and uh, they're kind of in our margin of error in terms of the number. And it's got and the interesting thing, if you can look across the table, is that the trust in doctors is going up and the trust in politicians is going down. Politicians live in a world of mistrust. The people they mistrust the most are their deputies and the people who work with them because those are going to be the people who will roll them in the end. So it is a different paradigm to live in. <coughs> Interestingly, half that table are complete strangers in the street. <laughs> what does that tell you? <coughs> just a couple of two astute commentators. This is a good, uh, a good quote. If, if politics is war without bloodshed, war is politics with bloodshed. Anyone know who said that? Mao Tse Tung. <laughs> you better guess these ones. Almost anything that can be attacked as a failure, this is in politics, but almost anything can be defended as not a significant failure. Politicians do not appreciate the significance of significant. Guess who said that? Sir Humphrey. Who's seen Yes Minister? <laughs> oh, if you get in a box set, you have to see Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. And this is for Kevin if he's still in the room. Conjurers offer the audience any card in the pack and always get them to take the one they want. This is the way the civil servants get ministers to make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there are many other reasons which we don't have time to go in, but it is partly due to a different worldview in the way that they have got to where they are and the way in which we've got to where we are. Um, and uh, I just want to just talk about the, the last one, the lobbying. Because lobbying is really important. Okay, they're putting in the line through from joining up Queenstown to, um, to Milford Sound. And lo and behold, what do they find? They find uranium. There is actually some down there, but they find it in mineable quantities. And it's, you know, mana, which is like Australia. Suddenly there's a potential for massive amounts of money. And of course health always gets lots of money. So here they are, the minister's basically got open slather. He can spend more money. So you just imagine that scenario. So what happens is that all the single disease advocates and, uh, are lining up down the terrace when they get into the beehive to you know, push their particular barrow. There are three notable absences. There are no general practitioners there because they are experts in multimorbidity and they're spending their whole time dealing with it. They can't get to Wellington. They're the experts of opportunity costs. They were still dithering around, wondering what they'd not do in order that they could go to Wellington. And of course the experts in transaction costs were so desperate not to pay the fee for the, for the, for the travel agent that they missed out on all the cheap seats and there weren't any flights left. <coughs> but the, the, the serious point behind that is that, is that you know, government policy is often made by um, you know, rational thought, but it's often also made by lobbying, and you can probably all think of examples of where daft things have become government policy because of very, very effective lobby groups. And of course there are opportunity costs to having any expensive policy in terms of what doesn't get done. Okay, so we'll come back to our question. Um, there are lots of leadership courses around, but um, I put it to you that they're like conferences. Um, if you go on a leadership course, by Wednesday you've forgotten not, even, not only what you learned, but where you went. Um, so if, it's, if, it is, um, if it is to be a true kind of training, that it has to be ongoing. Things that you learn, you have to apply, just like everything else, um, at the times. So if you don't keep doing it, you don't use it. Before we had an ECG machine in our practice, I must have learned how to read ECGs four times in my career, and I still couldn't remember. Now I'm looking at them a lot again. I can kind of remember that you have to keep practicing. So I'm going to suggest to you, as a, as a sort of way forward, that we need um, we need some incubators for clinical leaders, having identified who they are. And this picture now gets more um, complicated. So this is the, actually the, the model that we've adopted in, um, for education, that, as it happens, um, in Canterbury. And um, in that big box, you can see we have a team. It's a team of about 10 people who work with a team of about 40 clinician small group leaders. So 10 doctors, pharmacists, nurses, multidisciplinary program, work supported by analysts um, and, and heavily backed by the, um, by the directors um, of Pegasus. And that at the bottom runs 40 small groups of about 15 um, doctors, nurses or pharmacists. 
Um, and from those, we identify um, potential leaders to become small group leaders, and then they will filter through the organisation, get on the governance committees, both in, uh, internally and then externally, locally, and then for some of them um, nationally. And this has been going for 20 years. It's a, it's a mature program. Um, and um, I just put the red box on the side. From about 2007, we've had another group who also involved in this. It's Health Pathways. This is a primary and secondary care um, um, sort of consortium trying to work out referral pathways. This is a, a clinical, sort of a clinical um, pathway program. But you can see um, on the top left, industry has been parked out to the side. We don't want their money. Uh, and to be honest, we don't really want direct access to them because we don't need it because we can go to, um, uh, to uh, the literature directly and use our own critical appraisal um, skills for that. <coughs> Similarly, for when it comes to guidelines, be they national or be they international, then there is enough capacity to dissect those, look at the evidence yourself, and you may come to the same conclusion, you may not. Anyone thinks that evidence always leads you into one direction, why do we have juries? Um, anybody who thinks they know the answer to PSA testing, good luck. So there are lots of, there are lots of uh, times when the evidence can be looked at internally, but this, this is being looked at by the people who ultimately are the users of it. So if we're going to grow leaders, um, this is basically what I've been saying, we have a process, and, and I suggest that it's not the only process, but it's one of, of identifying and then being able to take them through, um, through that um, process of growth. And this is even more complicated now um, because this education has become a de facto the governance for the organisation, the clinical governance, I should say, not, not the overall governance, but the clinical governance is, is wrapped up in the same group. Um, and, um, and it's got a big red box around it because um, we are at the point now, or within um, the next few months, of merging Pegasus Health back with Partnership Health PHO. So we will have a sort of um, a hybrid organisation that takes on the functions of the PHO, strengthens its community engagement, strengthens its, um, its population focus, uh, but retaining the, um, the um, clinical um, leadership. And you see the, the words in the boxes have changed, um, and much in the way that um, I was describing before. And there is plenty of work for the new leaders to do. And I think it may well be time, you've seen this slide I'm sure before, where we've got a kind of public health over on the left and we've got hospital on the right and we're in this sort of red area in the middle and maybe it's time that we renegotiate this map. What's tending to happen, I suspect, as we, as we get organised and more organised, we're moving more to the left. But I think it is time to renegotiate that. While we've spent so much of our energy and our wisdom and our, our, our clever people arguing in the toss over terms and conditions of service in the last 20 years. I think we've kind of slightly lost, lost the focus on this population health thing and what's in fact happened rather than us setting the public health agenda, public health has set the clinical agenda for us in telling us how we're going to do things and why we should do things. So I think it's time for the Empire to strike back and, and we should be looking um, at renegotiating this with public health and with the politicians. You've heard of meta-analysis. You know, and some of you would have heard the quote that a meta-analysis is like the sausage. Only God and the butcher knows what went in it, <laughs> and neither would eat it. <laughs> um, so you get what you you get what you like out of meta-analysis. But I was listening yesterday, you know, the IHI thing. There's this talk about you know, medicine that matters rather than um, you know, what, you know what's the matter with you. It's what matters to you. So I've got to give you a meta-analysis. A bit twee, I know, but I thought it's I thought it things that I think that do matter and that we need to address. And we, we heard this morning, um, uh, you know, global warming is massive. But what do people need? And it's not just what we can give them in the way of pills. You have, we need a clean, healthy environment. And that, some of that is public health, some of it is us. Um, people need sufficient resources in order to be able to make healthy lifestyle choices. And it's self-evident, but it's still so true, so true. People need opportunity for education and employment. Obviously true. We even got down to what you do most of the time during your surgery. But I would say that if we wanted to sum it all up, what we need is well-motivated, educated and caring clinicians who can facilitate and implement informed healthcare choices. Now that's a catch-all phrase, but if, you, if we could all do that and we understood the science and we understood what was possible and we were responsible about the use of finite resources, then I think we would be and we should be pleased. Okay.
My time is nearly up, so I thought you'd want to have know what happened to these two characters. Okay, so we, we've jumped forward now about 10, 12 years. And this is the council of the, um, the uh, college. And that awful, awful blue pullover. <laughs> and the equally awful one slightly behind um, are those two boys, just um, are now men. And 10 years later, they're in their mid-twenties to start with, and now they're in their mid to late thirties. Jump forward just a year. Now something really peculiar happened between 1989 and 1990. Look, they both got respectable. <laughs> and they're both standing together in the back row. Look at that. Look at those two in the back row. I'm not so sure about the facial hair, but they are still, they are still there. And there's some other, other characters there that some of you who have been around the traps a while will recognise. Uh, right from uh, uh, Campbell Murdoch in the bottom there with his wonky tie. <laughs> and here we are. Some people never learn. It's still in this bloody photograph. Okay, so this is the uh, members of council just last year outside of the terrace. Now, a big change has happened. Okay? The man at the front has made it. He is the man. <laughs> Captain Fantastic, this is our Presidente. Okay? <laughs> The poor, poor chap at the back is now relegated to the back row and is still there as a blocker. <laughs> the line blocker at the back. But what you can also notice, and you you a bit relieved, all the facial hair has gone, so that's good. <laughs> but the one at the back is the evidence. Evidence. <laughs> when the evidence came out, my tie was gone. Okay, after all those years it was gone. I'm still thinking about the nose ring. <laughs> In contrast, <laughs> the man at the front is obviously moving in very, very, very high class tie circles. And I wonder where that might be. Political, political expediency, it rubs off as do the ties. But he's clearly had a much harder life than the man in the back. His <laughs> grey hairs are still, still yet to arrive. <laughs> Unfortunately, half-life of truth and science and evidence, you're lucky if it's you know, five years. In this instance, it was, it was as long as the rapid response. Because this was the people who had produced that particular survey in Australia, and guess what? It was a spoof. Okay? <laughs> And this is the reply of the authors, and it's, there's some very, very interesting things in that. The sense of humour or lack of it at the medical, they're saying, you know, what is, how has this happened? How thoroughly do the media check their resources? What's the state of evidence-based medicine? Does writing up something as a randomised control give it such credence that overrides common sense? How many pe people read articles? Is it abstract sufficient to create the correct perception of veracity? Who's, in, who's read just abstracts and forgot to read the rest of the paper? <laughs> We wish to set the record straight that this was a fictional study. It was simply intended to be and was labelled as medical humour. For the amount of interest it's generated, it may be a fertile area. <laughs> <laughs> now that, because I, I just read that just recently, because I had you know, seen the other things, a bit like the, the bottles that people put on their lawns to keep the dogs off, you know, as a spoof that went right around the world. So, I am always keen to change my mind. <laughs> So I'm still undecided. <laughs> <coughs> okay, and I'm going to finish. Um, almost on time. Um, uh, and this is this has a, a, a both a humorous but also a serious. Uh, this is um, the person at the back who looks like a Yugoslavian hitman. <laughs> is in fact um, Marian Pjakovic, who sadly passed away just um, um, a month or so ago. And this is uh, his family and my family. We used to have to take holidays together. And it, there are many things. Um, he was a, um, a clinical leader like no other. He, he could not only think beyond the square, he was often in a parallel universe. Um, and, um, but great leadership um, uh, potential. Interesting thing about that photo, I was thinking about that photo and when it was taken and what's happened to the people. There are three of my children, two of his children there. So and I, I did a quick calculation. I worked, when that photograph was taken, between that group, there were four university degrees. 
Next year there'll be 16 in that group, 16 university degrees in that group. How much of it is, how much of it is genetic, this leadership potential, and how much can be brought on? I guess I would put it to you that, that there is a, um, you, you have to be kind of pre-programmed for it, but, but we, we don't support and bring on um, our leaders as well as we can, and sometimes we, they, get, they get mauled in the political cauldron too early and, uh, and, and lose their, um, uh, lose the, you know, the world to carry on. there with the words of Sam <laughs> <laughs>